Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to IPMG's informational webinar. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Megan Stevenson from the Erskine Green Insti Training Institute, and she's going to be sharing information with us um, about the great things that the Institute does and what they have to offer to individuals. Um, before we get started, I would just like to remind everyone of a couple of things. Following today's webinar, when we end, you will receive a pop-up um, to complete a survey. And we encourage everyone to complete that survey. It helps us to plan for future webinars. And also that survey will be included in the follow-up email that you will be receiving um, in your email that you use to register. Um, and it will be sent a couple of days, two business days after the close of today's webinar. Also within that webinar will be a link that you can use to download a certificate of attendance if you need to use that for any training credit. And again, that survey link will be included in that follow-up webinar if you don't get the chance to do it at the close uh, when we close today. Also, as a reminder, we are recording today's webinar and the recording, along with the associated materials, will be available on our website, again, within two business days. Um, that's located in the resources section of our website, um, along with all the previous informational webinars that we've done. So if you are interested um, in looking at what's in our ar archives, um, those are listed there. So um, without further ado, I would um, now like to introduce our presenter for the day, Megan Stevenson. Megan received her bachelor's and master's degrees from Ball State University, her bachelor's degrees in special education with a major in intense interventions and a minor in mild interventions. Her master's degree is in an applied behavior analysis. She began her career as a high school special education teacher and transition coordinator where she trained, placed, and oversaw students working in the community. After teaching, Megan worked as a special education specialist with hands in autism, interdisciplinary training and resource center before joining the Arkham Indiana Foundation where she is in her sixth year as the director of Erskine Green, Erskine Green Training Institute. So please join me in welcoming Megan. And Megan, I am now going to turn the um, presenter controls over to you. And you should have that right now. All right, can you see my presentation? We can, yes, thank awesome. you. All righty, I will get started then, thank you. All right, so my name is Megan Stevenson. Like she said, I am in my sixth year as the director of Erskine Green Training Institute. So I'm going to spend um, the next 45 minutes or so talking about just our overall programming and the components involved. Um, and then if you have questions as I'm talking, please feel free to throw those questions in the chat box. And then when we are done, I will um, start answering those questions. So just to get started here, a little general information about us. We opened in the very beginning of 2016. So we have five years under our belt and we are now in year six of operation. Um, we consider ourselves a post-secondary vocational training program. So all of the students who come to our program have exited the school system. They are no longer tied to um, their K-12 school in their local area. Um, we don't care what type of document a student left high school with. So there's a lot of, you know, um, conversations across the state in regards to the different types of diplomas Indiana now offers, um, certificate of completions. Um, so we don't have a requirement in regards to you have to have had a certain type of diploma. Um, we look, we track this information for our own data purposes, but that's not a, a factor that we are looking at when determining um, whether or not we accept a student. We are really just interested in their vocational skills and do they have the vocational skills necessary to be able to do the job that they are coming here to learn. There is an age requirement um, as far as when they begin. So students need to at least be 18 years old 
by the, by the time they start the program. However, there's no cap on how old a student can be. Um, so right now, our average age is 23. Um, the oldest student we have had has been, I think he, he was 55, 54, 55. So, you know, those non-traditional students that still go on for um, training of some kind, we have those here as well. You just have to be 18 years old by the time you start one of our programs. I think everybody on the call is from Indiana, but maybe not. Maybe you know, uh, you work maybe by the Indiana border or you know people who live outside of um, Indiana. We do take out-of-state students, um, so that is an option if somebody is out-of-state and they want to attend EGTI. Most of our students have come from Indiana so far. Um, we were supposed to get a student from New York and then COVID came, so that kind of um, stopped that, but we do take out-of-state students. For individuals who have never been up to Erskine Green Training Institute, we are located in Muncie, Indiana. We are just a few minutes away from Ball State University's campus, um, and we are inside of a hotel. So a lot of times people have a hard time visualizing what we are or where we are. So I always say we are a school inside of a hotel, and this uh, picture on your screen is the hotel. So we are on the first floor of the Courtyard Muncie and it is connected to the Horizon Convention Center. So here's just a visual snapshot of um, a little bit of information about the profile of our students. So if you look there to the right, um, our students have come from 54 different Indiana counties. So if the county is green, we have had a student come from that area. Over on the left-hand side, you'll see two um, pictures. That top one, just represents what students left high school with. So we are at a dead tie uh, in regards to the, the number of individuals who have received a diploma out of high school and then those that have received a certificate of completion. So 50 or 48% have received a diploma, the 48 have received a certificate of completion, and the remaining few have either dropped out of high school or have received their GED. Um, to date, we have had 208 graduates. We have another eight here right now, so we've um, accepted 216, but officially 208 have graduated from EGTI. The application process, so just as one would apply to any type of post-secondary school, a student is required to apply to EGTI. Um, the application is on our website. They would download that application. They would gather some of the additional requirements, um, such as like a copy of an IEP, um, letters of recommendation, immunization records, criminal background check. There's a handful of other documents that we want submitted along with that application. It's mailed in. We take a look and make sure that we have everything we need. If there's anything missing, we will reach out to the individual and their family to let them know. Um, and then we schedule a two-hour interview and assessment. And this is done in person on site here at uh, EGTI. We want to make sure that whoever we are accepting has the vocational skills to be able to do the job that they are applying for. Um, and I'll talk about what those jobs are, but we, we really want to set students up for success. And so we want the whole interview process is trying to make sure that the student is going to be successful. From what we can tell, the skills that they're showing us, the student is going to be successful here and in, in the particular job that they're interested in. After that interview and assessment, the staff meet, they have a discussion of what they saw, strengths, any challenges, do they feel like this program is going to be a good fit for them, and then a letter is mailed home notifying them of their acceptance status. For all students accepted, they come to a new student orientation that takes a place a few weeks before they would actually move in, um, and the purpose of that new student orientation is to review details. So when's the date of move-in? What are things they should pack? Um, what does their meal plan look like? What do evenings and weekends look like? All of that type of stuff we review in detail at that new student orientation. Housing arrangements. So we are in a hotel, remember? So our students live in the hotel. Now, students who live within 60 miles of EGTI do have the option to commute. So being a commuter is one of the options that a student would have. Um, the majority of the students are living on site in one of the hotel rooms. Now they can have a single room or they can have a roommate. That is an option that they choose. They select that on their application. 
Um, and then we do our best to give them a roommate. So of course there are times where we have an odd number of males or females, or you know maybe we have six males but only five want a roommate. So there are some times where we get in a situation where we have an odd number and somebody wouldn't get a roommate, um, but we do our best to, to schedule roommates for those who are interested in one. Since students are living on site, they, we do have 24-7 support here. So Monday through Friday is our full-time instructional team, and they're the ones on the job site doing the vocational training. Then in the evenings, weekends, and, over, and overnight hours, we have part-time staff. And the role of our part-time staff is to provide general support. Um, so I'm always clear here. I want families to understand that this is not one-on-one -on -one support. So if your son or daughter or your consumer or your students need one-on-one -on -one support, this most likely is not going to be a good fit for them because we don't have the staffing to provide that level of support. Um, so for example, in the evenings and weekends, we have two staff here. Those two staff are, to, are here to support general things like I need support using the washer and the dryer or I want to go to CVS to get my medication refilled, but I need help getting on the right bus to get there. Um, it's Friday night and I don't really know what to do. Our part-time staff are here to help come up with ideas and activities and support them in going out and doing those activities. Um, and then we have one person overnight hours and that person is awake. They are in the hotel lobby where they could be found should students need support. Um, and then a lot of our students are on a home and community-based waiver of some kind. It is not a requirement. Um, we do not really, we're not directly involved with waiver services. So it's kind of like a separate thing. A student happens to be on the family support waiver, awesome. They would be in communication with their case manager to kind of discuss, okay, do we need to put any services on hold while they go to the training program? Are there any services that we want continued? Um, and they would have that conversation as a team. We aren't typically involved in those conversations. I will say that um, some examples of what that looks like here are students who have a behavioral therapist. It makes sense, and we highly recommend that that continues, whether or not um, they live close by and the behavioral therapist can drive here and meet with them in the evenings, or maybe it needs to be phone call check-ins or FaceTime check-ins. We really think that that consistency of having that behavioral therapist while they're here is important, so we would encourage that to continue. Um, obviously, things like respite hours, that stuff would, wouldn't be used while they are here. We have had some students use things like PAC services or CHEO hours um, on the weekends just to provide one-on-one -on -one support, maybe help clean up the room, provide one-on-one -on -one attention to go out and about in the community and maybe pick up some food for their room, things like that. Um, we do have a part-time nurse, but this part-time nurse only comes once a day, to ch once, a, once a week, not once a day. She comes once a week to check on medications. Um, so this is a, an important thing to make note of. We don't manage medication. So if a student um, requires um, parents or staff to supervise the intake of medications, you would want to be thinking about teaching the individual to do this on their own, or if it's something that they wouldn't be able to do, that would be an important piece when considering our particular environment. And then, of course, there are um, times where a student gets hurt, they get sick, and we need that nurse for consultation, and so she's available any other time that we need her input. Prereqs. So this document is on our website underneath housing or student living housing. Um, and this is worth taking a look at. Um, you know, a lot of services have goals aligned to them, um, waiver services. And so when you're going out in the community with a consumer um, or, you're, or you're providing um, PAC services or you're just doing respite care, um, these are skills that we really prefer our students have to make them more independent in our living environment. Um, so it's worth taking a look through those skills and just mentally kind of making note, yep, she can do those things, or I don't know, we better start working on this, just to increase overall independence so they're more successful in an environment like ours. So again, that PDF document can be found on our website. Training programs. Now, we don't call our... Um, training programs majors, for example. So, you know, when I went to Ball State, when a lot of you all went to college, you chose a major based on your skill set and based on your interests. That's 
the exact same thing as our training programs. So we call them training programs. We have nine different training programs. They are either 10 weeks long or 13 weeks long. So it's either 10 weeks they're living here on site or 13 weeks that they're living here on site. Um, and we have broken them down into healthcare training programs, hotel and restaurant training programs. So students who are training in a healthcare program still live here at the hotel, still spend their evenings and weekends here, but they walk down to the bus stop. So uh, Muncie has public transit. They ride the bus over to IU Health Ball Memorial Hospital where they train for the day, and then they return here to the hotel at the end of their work day. Um, some of these, when you're looking at these training programs, it's clear, everybody kind of knows exactly what that job entails. Like for example, a host at a restaurant. I think most people probably have a general idea of what a host does. Kitchen cook, okay, I think we have a general idea of what that person does. But some of the other terms, you know, may not be as clear. For example, inventory distribution, patient transport. Okay, what exactly would somebody learn if they were doing those jobs? So on our website, Underneath programs, we have videos of all nine training programs that we have to offer. So it's definitely definitely worth watching through these videos. If you're supporting somebody and you're part of kind of the team, helping guide kind of the decision in regards, in regards to what they do after um, high school, it's definitely worth watching these videos just so you yourself have an idea of what this program is. So you better know like, okay, I don't know, like, Front desk agent requires money handling, and my consumer does not do well with money handling, so maybe front desk agent just isn't a good fit for them. Um, but watching these videos will give you, will give interested individuals a better idea of what exactly that job requires. Career sampling sessions. So we offer these throughout the year, um, and we always have offered these, and they've been very popular. You know, a lot of individuals Come, from, come out of high school with very little to no work experience or no volunteer experience. So when they have to, when they're asked, you know, would you be interested in doing, you know, one of the nine training programs at Earth and Green Training Institute, they don't really have a lot of history to pull from for reference. Um, so they don't know. They don't know what they're interested in. They don't know what they're good at. So a career sampling session would be good for somebody like that. Um, normally, these are two days. We spend one day at the hotel and restaurant, one day over at the hospital. Um, for obvious reasons, we're not able to do career sampling sessions in the hospital right now. But I, was, I want to make clear, our students and staff are able to be in the hospital right now. They just kind of view the career sampling session as like extra visitor type things. And so they've um, stopped those right now. So right now, we're just doing one day only. But in that one day, we are still assessing all nine programs. There's stuff that we can do here um, in, at EGTI to still assess these skills. And so on that one day, students would rotate and get to sample all nine programs that we have to offer. And our staff assess them on five skills in each of the nine programs. So for those five skills, they get scored based on how they do. And then that is converted to a percentage. Um, and then students would leave with documentation that shows how they scored. And then that can be used to better determine one, like, am I even interested in anything that EGTI has to offer? Maybe, maybe not. And that's okay. Um, and two, to identify which training programs would be a better fit for your skill set than others. So um, registration for that is on our website. You can see upcoming dates, and then the fee for that is $25. But a career sampling session is a good opportunity for individuals who just aren't sure uh, maybe which training program would be a good fit for them. Training session structure. So we have four sessions a year, session one, two, three, and four. So right now we're in session one. This group of students graduates April 2nd, um, and then we get a new group that moves in April 11th. So there are four different groups of students coming each year. We would never take more than 20 at a time. So our Staff to student ratio is pretty tight, and we want that to be, to be able to provide the level of support that we feel is necessary for our students to become successful on the job. They are training Monday through Friday, so they don't ever work on Saturdays and Sundays, so they don't train on Saturdays and Sundays. Typically, they're beginning around 8 a.m., and they end around 3.30. Now, those times adjust a little bit just based on what they're learning, what environment they're in. Sometimes they'll work evening shifts. 
again, depending on which training program they are in. But generally speaking, it's Monday through Friday from around 8 to 3.30. And then our content instruction varies based on the group. Um, we have large group instruction only on Friday afternoons. Aside from that, it's small group, one-on-one, -on -one, all on the job. So there's very little classroom work that you would um, think of, that you see like in a more traditional post-secondary school. Much of our, our training and work is all done in the natural environment or in our training lab to do some pre-teaching before they go into the general environment, natural environment. A little more about our training session structure. So it's remember, it's 10 or 13 weeks long. Week one, we call that the orientation week. So um, it's just trying to get students into the groove of what their new life, new living environment is going to be like for the next few months. You know, students are homesick. You know, this is their first time they've been away from home a lot of the times. Getting to know the students, the, the staff, figuring out just how to wake up on time, get breakfast, get down to class. Um, a lot of just learning your meal card, all of that is the focus of week one. Week two, students then separate and begin their job training. And each week, content is introduced and it just builds upon each other until all content has been introduced and taught. And then those last four weeks, we, we call that the internship phase, which there's really nothing different happening, it, it, but it, it's a mindset of, okay, we've taught it all. You're working the shift just like anybody else would be working the shift and staff will begin fading themselves out if they can. Friday afternoons is the one time we do large group instruction, and the topics are always around work readiness related skills. So developing a resume, um, understanding the interview process and practicing interviews, um, talking about terminology that you would see on an application. So things like that are Friday afternoons. And then all day, every day, Staff are always identifying and working on a variety of social communication functional skills that our students need to work on. Um, you know, we have some students where time management is not an issue. They are on time constantly. It doesn't need to be talked about. Other students, time management is something that needs to be worked on. And, you know, learning how to set your cell phone alarms and do reoccurring cell phone alarms, that has to be worked on. We have some students who have to work on appropriate coping strategies on the workplace. Others don't need to work on it. Some students need to work on hygiene and appropriate dress. Others don't need to work on it. So those types of skills are really just targeted and worked on on an individual basis as our staff see these skills pop up in the workplace. Community access checklist. So the number one concern oftentimes of parents is letting their son or daughter go and kind of letting go control of, um, of them and being nervous about them being out and about on their own. So um, in order to do our part in assuring safety and making sure we're putting students in environments that we feel they have the skills to handle, we have developed this community access checklist. And it is broken into levels one, two, and three. Um, and all students start at the same level. Um, and then students progress through these levels. Some move through these levels very quickly. Some don't move through quickly, and that is okay. Um, but based on their level, that lets staff know what they can do by themselves or what they need to do with a part-time staff. So level one is all about staying back at the hotel by yourself. Do you have the skills? Do we feel you have the skills to stay back at the hotel by yourself? For example, remember, we only have two staff working, right, in the evenings and weekends. So let's say a group wants to go to the Ball State Student Center for dinner and another group wants to go to the movies, but then we have one student who doesn't want to go. Well, what, do we, what about that one student? We only have two staff. Well, if that student has been checked off on level one, we feel comfortable leaving them back by themselves. If they haven't been checked off on level one, they can't stay by themselves. Part-time staff would have to be present. So level one is all about stranger interaction. What do you do if somebody knocks on your hotel room door? Um, what do you do if somebody approaches you in the hotel lobby and begins engaging in a conversation that leads to like, oh, what floor are you on? What's your room number? What does the student say? Um, what if somebody says, hey, I'm parked out front here. I have a few pieces of luggage. Do you mind giving me a hand? What does a student do? So we practice the stuff. We role play. We talk about what to say, what to do. And then there are people that we know that our students do not know, and they we bring them in and they help assess these skills, and then they report back to us 
how the student did. Um, there are times where our students have left the hotel with this fake stranger, and that's okay, but now we know we have more work to do. We're not gonna check them off on level one yet. Other students handle these scenarios perfectly, or others maybe don't handle them so well at the beginning, but after more practice and scenarios, they then get it down pat. So once they pass those assessments, we'll check them off on level one. Then we start looking at level two. Level two is all about wanting to walk around downtown Muncie by yourself. There's the YMCA, there's a pottery painting place, there's an ice cream place, there's a Mexican restaurant. So there's a variety of things that students would access downtown Muncie that they would walk to. Well, before we let them go by themselves, they have to be checked off on level two. So what are your pedestrian skills like? Do you know how to navigate around? Um, do you know how to handle if a panhandler were to come up and ask you for money because there is a transfer bus um, stop there. So people hang around. Sometimes that brings about individuals asking for a buck or two. Um, there's restaurants down there on the meal plan that require tipping. How do you do with tipping? So we practice this stuff. We um, teach how to use a tipping app. We go out and we practice the tipping. We have a father that we use of a former staff who plays our panhandler. So we put students in some scenarios where he approaches them and asks for money. So we do these assessments to better determine, do we feel comfortable letting the student walk around by themselves or no, we'll wanna make sure that a part-time staff goes with them. If a student gets checked off on level two, we start looking at level three, which is about mastering the bus system, which is called MITS. Identifying which route you need to take to get you to where you're going, wanting to go, you know what side of the street to stand on, all of that. Um, once we feel a student has it down pat, we then schedule a bus assessment where they have to plan um, going to two different locations using two different routes and they have to get back within two hours. And if a student can do all of that, then we'll check them off on level three, which means they can go anywhere on the bus by themselves. Um, so we do not just let students go out completely on their own. That decision is, is made upon what level they are on on the community access checklist. Now, students can always do what they want. It's really just a matter of can they do it by themselves or would part-time staff need to be present with them. Evening and weekend activities. People are like, what do they do in the evenings and weekends? Well, they do exactly what we all do, right? We rest or we go out to dinner with some friends or we go work out. Um, that's exactly what our students do. So they are able to do what they want. We don't force them to do anything. They get to choose. Now our part-time staff present activities like, hey guys, tonight let's go to the student center at Ball State and eat and then go down to the student center basement and do bowling. Some students could say, yeah, I wanna go do that. And others may be like, nah, I have other, I, I'm gonna do something else. Or I'm just gonna hang back here. Um, so students get to choose, but our part-time staff present different activities, encourage students to, to get out and try some new things. We have Ball State volunteers who are who serve as community and fitness mentors for us. So a student could choose to have a fitness and community mentor, which means once a week you would meet with your fitness mentor and you would have to do some type of physical activity, whether that's going to the YMCA, going on a walk, going on a jog. We've had a student bring their bike. They've gone on bike rides. Just once a week, you would have to meet with your fitness mentor. And then the community mentor is similar. Once a week, you would meet with your community mentor and you would have to get out. So you're going out into the community, you're doing something fun. Go make dinner at their apartment or house, go get your nails done, go see a movie, something like that. Um, students who are living on site all have a meal plan. So they get a bank card that looks just like, I know it's hard to see because it's white, but it's a white or a blue card that looks just like that, has a student's name on it. Um, and that is what they use for their meals. Now we have control over how these cards work. So there's about 35 approved restaurants on this card. And that's the only place where these cards work. So if a student tries to swipe it at the mall or um, at the movies, which they have, or they try to buy something online, which they have, it'll get blocked. So they can't, and they also can't pull cash out with it. So um, these cards only work at the approved approved restaurants. And then there's staff emails are linked to these cards. So anytime a student purchases or tries to swipe it and it gets declined, our staff get an email. Anytime a student purchases a meal over $25, our staff get an email so they can follow up on, you know, why they were spending $30 on lunch. 
Um, if it drops below $50, our staff get an email. So our staff monitor these cards um, to help make sure the money lasts until Friday. Every Friday they get more money. Visitation hours, this is always a question we get asked. Um, so yes, parents, you can come and visit your son or daughter, or yes, they can go home. So again, just like you know, when I went to college, I, my parents could come up on a Wednesday night to take me out to dinner, or I could go home on the weekend, or they could come up on the weekend. That is the same. So um, students are more than welcome to, to have visitors on, on the, in the evening during the week or on the weekends, or they can go home as well. Certifications. So when students graduate, everybody will receive an AGTI certificate that says the name of the program and the, the length of it. Um, there are some additional certifications that some students can get depending upon the program that they are in. So our kitchen cooks, they go through the Surf Safe training and then they take that test and they have the opportunity to earn their Surf Safe certification. We also use some training material through the American Hotel and Lodging Association to supplement some of what we are teaching and then they take an assessment through them and if they score a certain percent then they receive certification through them as well. So our front desk agents take a test, um, they take a few tests. Our heart of the house, which is where that room attendant falls under, they take a test, kitchen cooks take a test as well. So if they pass, then they would receive a certificate through the American Hotel and Lodging Association. And then our patient transporters are all CPR certified. Now we have some students who don't pass some of these tests and that is okay. They aren't removed from our programming. Um, and sent home. It's just This is just an opportunity to earn an additional certificate that they can add to their resume. Program funding. So there are a few different routes that individuals have or could take. Um, right now, we have uh, some scholarship opportunities through the AWS Foundation. Um, that money is targeted for individuals who live in one of the 11 Northeast Indiana counties. So if you are working with somebody or you are someone who lives in one of the 11 Northeast Indiana counties, we currently have scholarship dollars available to support your programming costs. Some families have just private paid. They have the money saved up and they have the, the means to just pay for this um, out of pocket. A lot of our students are working with vocational rehabilitation. Um, it's not a requirement, but a lot are working with vocational rehabilitation and if the employment goals and the individual's um, individualized plan for employment align with a program that EGTI has to offer, then there may be an opportunity for VR to cover those costs. But it has to, our training that we are providing has to align with the employment goals that the individual has in their plan for employment. We've had some individuals pay through an ABLE account. Um, so a lot of people are familiar with the 529 accounts. We are not able to take 529 account dollars because we aren't offering degrees or credits. However, we can take ABLE account dollars. So these few individuals, they had 529 accounts that were not gonna be used. So they transferred those, those dollars over to the ABLE account and then paid through their ABLE account. Um, and then a lot of people have special needs trusts. We haven't had anybody pay through their trust account, but that is an option. If you do have a trust, um, under your name or under your son or daughter's name and there's money in it, um, that can be used to cover the cost as well. Completion of training. So students are moving back to their hometown once they are done with, with our training program. Um, we have had some individuals move to Muncie and we of course always love that, but that's not the common situation. You know, I went to Ball State and then I moved back to my hometown. Same with our students. They come here and they're trained, then they move back to where they're from. Um, most of our students are working with vocational rehabilitation. So when they return home, they're gonna be working with their employment provider to then um, get placed in employment and then receive any follow along support that they may, be, that they may need. We always do follow up surveys eight and 18 months post graduation. This is our most recent one. So COVID did impact it a little bit. Um, which is to be expected, so we hope to see that rebound. Um, but as of our most recent data reflected, um, at the eight-month mark, <coughs> excuse me, 
77% of our students are employed. At the 18 month mark post-graduation, 80% of our students are employed. That 77% number was at uh, 82 right before COVID, so it's dipped a little bit. Of those employed, we, I get this question frequently, so I made sure that this was on here. Of those employed, and this is reflecting the eight, per, eight month data, 87% of those are working in an area that they were trained in. 70% are part-time while 30% are full-time. Camp EGTI, so this is our second year. Camp kind of new for us. We did one three-week camp last year. This year we are doing two separate two-week camps. So if you know of an individual who is between the ages of 18 and 22 and looking for a camp this summer, um, we do, we're doing a two-week camp. So that's two weeks of them living on site gives us an opportunity to be able to work on a, a wide variety of skills um, to help in that transition out of high school. More information of that uh, on that is on our website. Social media, we are um, very involved and active on social media. So if you follow us on here, you should get a pretty good idea of just what goes on day to day and then also be able to see any upcoming events such as general tours, things like that. And any questions? Thank you, Megan. This is really great information. And we do have a few questions. Um, I think you may have answered some of these already in your presentation, but um, I'll go ahead and ask just so you can reiterate. Um, right. So the first question is, is asking if they are required to have their GED. Nope. No requirement at all. We've had some students who have dropped out. So there's no requirement in any type of high school competency or anything like that. Okay, perfect. And I think you've already answered this too, but I guess um, just to reiterate, um, how long do they live uh, at uh, the Institute while they're going through their training? So our training programs are either 10 weeks in length or 13 weeks in length. So that's the length of time that they would be living here on site. And then there's a question asking about the cost difference between staying, living on site or staying at home, also a single room versus sharing a room. Yeah, so it's a big difference. So living on site is a big cost. You're living in a hotel. So if you are just being a commuter, that cuts the cost over 50%. Because um, then you're not paying for a room and board. You don't have a meal plan, so you're not paying for room and board. You're not paying for um, our community living support staff. So it cuts it over 50%. Um, and then the single room versus double room, then you're looking at, it's not cutting the overall cost, but then when you look at the room and board package, it cuts that down about 50-ish percent because now you're splitting the cost of the room. I'm assuming very similar to if you were staying uh, in a dorm versus mm -hmm. um, commuting to yep. um, your classes. Yeah. Um, this question I think is is um, very interesting and something that I'm sure you have experience with. So if an individual is can is using or continues to utilize waiver services while attending the school outside of their of where they live, so outside of their county or their home city, um, are virtual team meetings appropriate? And is a case manager able to visit the individual in person um, while they are um, at the training institute? Yeah, so a few things with that. One, we've had individuals who have to change their service provider while they are here on site because let's say and I'm just making this up, so don't hold me to this. So let's say I live in Plainfield, Indiana, right? So I have Sycamore Services near me. Now, I do not know where Sycamore Services, um, they might provide service in, Del in Delaware County, but let's just say they don't. So I live in Plainfield. I utilize Sycamore Services. Well, now I'm going to move to Delaware County, and Sycamore Services may not provide services in Delaware County. Well, then you're going to have to change your provider um, to, let, let's say, Hillcroft, to provide that service while you're living here in Delaware County. So that's one thing that has come up and people have switched their provider for that short period of time. Um, 
with the like the quarterly meetings and things like that our students have those all the time sometimes they have them here on site and the the way the case manager will reach out and say like hey do you have a meeting room we can use or can we just meet in the hotel lobby that stuff happens frequently some of our staff have participated in those quarterly meetings um, yes uh, waiver staff or case managers have come up and visited students as well so all of that has happened frequently and hasn't been a problem at all um, it might also be worth throwing out here. We've had um, a student on the aged and disabled waiver, and he um, his physical disability impacted him in a way to where he could do the job that he was here learning, but he needed support with like showering and some restroom things and just like getting ready for the, the day or getting ready for bed. So um, through the waiver, they had a nurse that came every morning and kind of did that whole routine because remember, we don't support showering and toileting and all that stuff, but the nurse provided that. And then she came midday to do some restroom things and then came at the end of the day. So we have had that type of structure happen before and it worked out, it worked fine. Awesome, great. Uh, the next question is asking how many uh, people typically apply for each session? So that depends. Um, the most we've had at one time is 17. Some sessions we see tend to be bigger, kind of depends on the time of year. Others tend to be smaller, depending on the time of year. We have some programs that are popular. Um, we only will take five individuals per program at a time. So when you are applying, you are applying for one of five slots. Um, Inventory distribution tends to be a popular one frequently. So there's been times where our five slots are filled up. So then you would have to wait for the next time we offer it. Kitchen Cook is another popular one that has filled up. So um, some programs, depending on the time of year, are fuller than others. But we've not we've not yet reached capacity. Great. Several, several comments about um that how cool this program sounds and also some comments um, from those that have had supported individuals that have went through the program and how great it was. So uh, okay. we're definitely very glad to hear that and to share that information. Um, next question is asking if the community activities that the individuals participate in um, are included in the tuition or is that out of pocket? So like they go to the movies or they go to the student center, are those things out of pocket? Out of pocket. So think of, um, let's say me, I went to Ball State, right? I paid a room and board fee and I had a Ball State meal card. So I would use that going to the dorms and stuff like that. But if I wanted to go out with my friends and go eat at Buffalo Wild Wings, I was paying my personal money. Or if I wanted to go get my nails done or go to the movies, I was paying with my own personal money. So that's the same thing here. Um, room and board includes, you know, your overnight, but then also your meal card. That meal card works at about 35 different meal locations. So anything outside of that and then any leisure activities that a student would choose to participate in would be their own money. Thank you. The next question um, is asking um, or stating that in 2018, there was information that um, the Institute was looking to expand to Southwest Indiana or the Evansville area. Um, just said if, if you have any information on the status of that. Yeah, so we were working pretty closely and have made it pretty far along in the planning process with Toyota down in um, down near in Princeton near Evansville um, and then when we get to the funding piece to kind of get all those pieces worked out that's where it kind of fizzled out so right now there is no active plan down there but there is an active plan up here to, to continue growing our program so we've had some conversations with some manufacturer places up here and some other um, like warehouse dis distribution places up here. So that's the, that is the ultimate goal, is to increase the programs that we are offering. There is nothing set in stone right now for me to tell you, like, in 2022, we're going to offer this. That stuff's still being worked on, but it is definitely a goal to grow the programs. Thank you. Um, the next question is related to the summer camp. 
um, and asking what is the cost for that and can waiver dollars pay for the summer camp? So the summer camp, I'm trying to pull it up. The summer camp is just self-funded, so we don't take other, um, but right now we, we don't take other funding for that. That might be down, something down the road that we would change, but right now it's just self-pay. Um, and the cost is $3,800 for the two weeks, and that includes um, your room and your meal plan and tuition and materials and stuff like that. So $3,800 for those two weeks. Thank you. Um, are there any scholarships uh, for individuals that live in Lake County? I know you mentioned the scholarships available through the AWS Foundation for yeah. Northeast Indiana, but are there any available for Lake County, which would be Northwest? Yeah, we've had a ton of students come from Lake County. We don't have anything right now. Right now, the, the pot of scholarship money that we have is from the AWS Foundation. Now, there's always a chance that that changes, but right now what we have available is from the AWS Foundation, um, the Northeast um, counties. Thank you. Um, someone does just want to make sure um, that individuals do not have to have any type of schooling at all, I'm, I'm reading the question, as long as they are 18. Um, she this supports uh, some individuals that have not ever went to a traditional high school. Yeah, so we've had individuals who have dropped out. We've had individuals who have done the online, like Indiana Connections School. Um, yeah, we, we do not care what type of schooling or what happened in their schooling. We really are just looking at the vocational skills and obviously the behavioral skills, you know, behaviorally. Um, can they be successful in this environment? But the vocational skills are what we are interested in. Do you have the vocational skills necessary to be able to do the training program that you're applying for? Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is related to the specific training programs that are available and if there are limits for those. So for example, if all 20 people uh, want to the same program, is that possible? No. So we only take five per program. So um, this might be confusing if I'm just verbally explaining it. So let's, for example, right now, we we always offer either four or five programs at a time. So we have four 13-week four programs, and we have five 10-week programs. So right now we are offering our four 14, our, our four 13 week programs. Once they graduate, then we're going to get our 10 week program students. So we have five 10 week programs. So of right now of these four programs that we are running, we aren't going to take 20 in one program. We will not take more than five. So we would maybe have five front desk agents, five patient transporters, um, five kitchen cooks five part of the house, so no more than five. So if we were to get 10 people that all applied for the same session, same program, we would have to turn away five of them and move them to the next program. So when we have 20 students, they are spread across four to five different programs. I hope that makes sense. It does, yes, okay. thank you. Um, the next question is asking if, um, and I know you talked about how individuals are still able to utilize their waiver services while they're receiving or while they're going through the training program. Um, this is asking if there's a specific provider agency required for their waiver services. And I don't believe so. They would still continue no. to have choice as long as that provider provides services in Delaware County. Correct, yeah. Um, the example that I had, somebody had selected Hillcroft, but, you know, there's Hopewell up here, too. There's other, Help at Home, maybe. There's others that are up here. So the case manager would be the one doing that with the consumer, helping them identify which which um, provider they're wanting to select. All right, thank you. If uh, an individual, and these are all great questions, so thank you all so much. It's, it's yeah. really great to see all the excitement and enthusiasm um, for the program and for what uh, you've shared with us today. Uh, the question is, if an individual um, 
stays off campus, so they're commuting, um, mm -hmm. is there options for them to still be able to engage in the community activities with the group? Absolutely. So we encourage that. You know, the few commuters we have, some haven't selected that, but we encourage that to hang around here in the evenings, like bring a bag, change your clothes, and go out to dinner with students. Or they can still have the community and fitness mentor and still participate in that. So, yes, we absolutely encourage and welcome our commuters to still hang around here in the evenings and stuff. That's great. Um as a Ball State alumni, I'm going to give a shout out to Muncie, and uh, <laughs> um, there are some fun <laughs> things to do in that yeah. in that area. Um, yeah. So, could you just um, reiterate? I, I think you mentioned this, but uh, the job placement rates um, for graduates. Um, yeah, I think you so, mentioned that, and also there, this is a two part question. Um, okay. In addition to that, is any one career path so far more successful in assisting individuals in obtaining employment after their graduation from the program? So the first part, I try to scroll back. I don't know if you guys can see it. So here's our most recent. Next Friday, I shoot out the next round of um, assessment or surveys. So this will be updated here in a month or so. But right now, um, at the eight month mark, 77% were employed. And at the 18-month mark, 80% were employed. So that's our current um, placement uh, statistics. For what's most popular, I don't, I don't have that off the top of my head. Like if there is one that's more popular than another, so I can't really speak to that. Um, you know, patient transport is a popular one, but you need to live in an area where you have access to a hotel that has patient transport as a job. Kitchen Cook is a popular program. Um, Heart of the House has been a popular program. Front Desk Agent has been a popular program. I would probably, without knowing, because I don't have this uh, off the top of my head, Kitchen Cook has probably been our most popular to date. And then when you look at placement, you have a variety of places where you can work. You know, you could go, we've had students with um, who graduate in the Kitchen Cook program and work on a university campus. Um, we have, like, somebody's worked on Earlham College, if I say that right, Franklin College, Butler University. Um, we, you can then work in a hospital. We've had students who leave the Kitchen Cook program and go work in hospitals. Some go work in the actual restaurant. Some go work in um, like high school cafeteria. So there's a wide variety of environments um, in which you can go and work after uh, a kitchen cook training. But I would say kitchen cook is probably our most popular. Thank you. Um, so I know there are a few questions um, about, um, you know, if an individual um, that you're working with as a case manager um, is going to the institute and want to do about pick list and those kinds of things. So um, you might want to talk to your supervisor about that and whether a pick list would be needed if an individual remains with their current provider, but they're just changing county. Um, mm -hmm. So those kind of things, we definitely will be able to support you with um, as you're working with individuals um, that are planning to go to the institute. So just talk to your supervisor and they can help you um, with those specific things as far as waiver services go. Um, and we talk to our families. Um, if there's follow through, that's a different thing. But during an interview and assessment, that two hour initial interview and assessment when our staff are determining whether or not this is an appropriate fit for the individual, I then am meeting with the parents during that time. And I'm talking about, okay, you're on one of the home and community-based waivers. Let's talk about what that looks like while they are here. You will want to talk with your waiver case manager to kind of iron out what services you may want to use or may not want to use. So I am bringing that up in my meeting with parents, hopefully prompt them to then go follow up with their case manager. You know, I don't know if that always happens, but just know that we are mentioning that in that initial um, assessment during that parent meeting. Great, thank you. The next question, we have time for a few more questions. 
Um, any questions that we're not able to get to today, I will be sharing them with Megan, and um, she can provide the responses back, and we'll share that on our website. Again, um, the recording in the slides from today um, in the Q&A will be posted on our website within a couple of days, and uh, you'll be able to access that. And so any questions we aren't able to get to, I will share those with Megan, and, and we'll include those in the Q&A document that's located on the website. Uh, the follow-up uh, support staff that are available, um, do they live in the hotel along with the program participants? So our part-time staff that we have, we have two different positions. We have community living support and we have overnight support. So our community living support, those are the individuals that we have two working at a time. So there's two here in the evenings and there's two, we have a few different shifts, but always two on Saturdays and Sundays. And their role is just to help students kind of here within the hotel, but also help them get out and about in the community, access different activities. Um, then our overnight person comes in overnight hours, and they are not, this is not a sleeping position. They are awake. They are required to be out in the hotel lobby where they could be found. So it's not like an RA situation where, you know, like when I lived in the dorms, my RA lived on my floor. Um, there is not that. Our community living support, they're awake while they're here, and then they get off work around 10, 30, 11 p.m. at night, and then our overnight person arrives, and then they are here awake until 7.30 a.m., and then full-time staff show up, or then on the weekends, our other community living support show up. So they're not living here and staying in the rooms. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is asking how many accessible rooms um, are there? I don't know. That would be a hotel question. I don't know the the breakdown of that in the hotels. Um, you know, we have students, the students of ours that have used wheelchairs, they're in a wheelchair accessible room. Um, we have plenty of those, so we've never had an issue. There's more accessible rooms here than what you're going to find at a, a typical hotel, but I don't know the numbers off of the top of my head. But, you know, it's just, just it's kind of the students who have used wheelchairs, um, we have like roll-in showers and stuff and then automatic door openers. So when they swipe their key, their door opens automatically, things like that. So they've been placed in those rooms, which have been super user-friendly. Someone has uh, made a comment that uh, she was able to attend the final meeting where the individual completes their training and presents their slideshow and speaks, and it was a wonderful experience. So I just wanted Good. to share that. Um, yeah, just no. I'm glad I'm glad you made that comment. So we do an exit meeting. So I know they were having some exit meetings earlier today. So in the last two weeks, our staff will schedule a meeting um, with the staff, students, parents, the art counselor, job coach, waiver staff. Just know that anybody is invited to that. So if you have a consumer that's coming to us, know that an exit meeting is coming and ask. You know, I don't. Sometimes, you know, we might be hoping the parent relays some of that information. If it's not happening, then we don't know. But just know that we do hold exit meetings, and we are always more, we enjoy having everybody on. So, you know, we've had ones where waiver staff or case manager or behavioral therapists are all on, and we that's, um, that's awesome. So just know that the exit meeting is a thing, and that's coming. So if you don't hear about it, reach out to the family or reach out to us so you can be a part of that meeting. Um, we have time for two more questions, I think. Um, so the next one is asking if you know if there is a long waiting list uh, for VR to pay or to assist with the cost of the program. So I would say that is dependent upon where you live. I think some VR offices are busier than others. Um, I have not heard personal stories from families where they're having to wait a, a long time to get a meeting. Now, it might be a few months, um, but I'm not hearing anything that's, like, outrageous. But, again, that's dependent upon, like, I think Marion County probably has a longer time than a rural area. So I would say that is probably dependent upon where, where you are. Great, thank you. And then um, this is not a question, but a comment, and I will definitely agree with this, that your 
um, Facebook page and other social media pages, which I follow, which IPMG also follows as a company, um, is really a great way to get an idea of some of the things that the students are doing after hours. Yeah. I always enjoy um, seeing you know, where they're going and the fun things that they're doing um, out in, um, in Muncie. So um, please, you know, look for them on social media. Um, and it will really help you get an idea of some of the things that the students are doing. Um, well, um, I, again, want to thank you, Megan, for joining us today and sharing this information. I think it's been very helpful. It's given a um, really good idea of what this, the training involves and what the Institute does and, and how successful it's been in supporting individuals in, um, you know, obtaining a career in um, in an area that they're interested in. So I will let everyone know just once again um, that at the close of the webinar, there will be a survey that pops up after we end. Um, again, I encourage you to uh, complete that at that time, or you can complete it in the link that will be sent with the follow-up email that will also contain a link to download your training certificate. Um, if you're going to be using this for any internal credit um, with your organization. And um, I would also like to say that we will not be having an informational webinar in April, um, where we will be taking that month off for some internal company training that we're going to be doing, but we will be back um, with an informational webinar on May the 21st. And we will be sharing that information in the upcoming week, so please watch for that either in your email or on IPMG social media or in our newsletter uh, that we'll be sending out. So watch for that. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Megan. And you um, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.